que necesita. <risa> I want to talk to you today about the New and Everlasting Covenant. What is the New and Everlasting Covenant, and why is it so important? To put it plainly, this covenant is the work of Jesus Christ and the core message of the Bible. The Bible describes the New and Everlasting Covenant in detail, particularly in the New Testament, where both Jesus and the Apostles refer to it simply as the New Covenant. So what is the New Covenant? It is the mission and message of Jesus Christ, the good news through which we are reconciled to God. I'd like to explain how the LDS Church has replaced the biblical explanation of the New Covenant with something completely outside of the mission and teachings of Christ. I'm going to approach this topic through the perspective of the LDS Topical Guide and other scripture study resources. For over 30 years, the LDS Church has used these study helps to actively direct the scripture study of its members. By looking at these resources, we are not drawn to the central tenet of Christianity, but are called to focus on a different gospel. I was raised in the Mormon Church, and it was my study of the LDS Topical Guide and other scripture study resources that had a profound impact on my conversion to Christianity. You may be thinking that it's misguided to place so much trust or focus on the LDS study helps. But if this is your thought, then you should remember two things. First of all, these study materials are presented as accurate and trustworthy by the general authorities of the church. When these resources were first introduced to the world, Elder Boyd K. Packer said that there was a spirit of inspiration brooding over this work. He said that the worthy men and women working on this project were inspired in their efforts. He also said that these LDS scripture study resources were the fulfillment of two separate prophecies, one in Ezekiel and one in 2 Nephi. Today, LDS leadership is still presenting the study resources as accurate and trustworthy. In 2013, the LDS Church updated their scriptures, stating that the intention of the update was to correct mistakes in the study helps and to incorporate recent historical findings into the chapter headings. So even if there were mistakes or biases in the study helps when they were first published, the LDS Church has now corrected any issues that may have existed. If you still think that the focus shouldn't be on the LDS study helps, the second thing you should remember is that Elder Boyd K. Packer said that critics of the LDS Church make false assumptions because they don't open the topical guide. In all of their watching and claiming, they have missed the most important of all things that we have done in recent generations. Some of them say that we've lost our way, that we're not Christians. Should they turn to that one thing in which they show the least interest, and in which they have the least knowledge, the scriptures and the revelations, they would find now in the topical guide 58 categories of information about Jesus Christ. 18 pages of small print, single-spaced list, literally thousands of scriptural references on the subject. These references from the four volumes of scripture constitute the most comprehensive compilation of scriptural information on the mission and teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ that has ever been assembled in the history of the world. Elder Packer says that the critics of the LDS Church have missed the most important thing the church had done in recent generations, referring to the production of the study resources. Elder Packer says that the critics make the false assumption that Mormonism isn't Christianity, in part because they don't open the topical guide to see all the references about Jesus. In regard to the mission and teachings of the Savior, Elder Packer said that these LDS resources were the most comprehensive ever produced in the history of the world. When I was a Latter-day Saint, I believed that they were. 
I was LDS for 14 years, born under the covenant, and I respected the work that went into the creation of the LDS study hubs. I used them frequently, and I turned to them when I wanted to know how Scripture explained the new and everlasting covenant. However, I was dismayed when I realized that the comprehensive LDS resources do not adequately acknowledge the crowning event of Christ's work. The covenant established at his death. John the Baptist testified that the mission of Jesus was to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus even said that his blood of the new covenant would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. But these comprehensive study resources draw attention away from the biblical explanation of the new and everlasting covenant and elevate temple marriage in its place. Before expounding on the biblical explanation, I want to dive a little further into the common LDS understanding for the New and Everlasting Covenant. If you are an active Latter-day Saint or have been LDS at some point in your life, please fill in the blank. The crowning blessings of life come through obedience to the covenants and honoring of the ordinances received in the holy temples, including the New and Everlasting Covenant of which is the capstone of the holy endowment. The word missing from this quote is marriage. The common LDS phrase is the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And when it's described as the crowning blessing or the capstone of the endowment, it's easy to see why Latter-day Saints are so focused on the LDS temple and not on the biblical explanation of the new covenant. They are distracted because the marriage ordinance is described in such magnificent terms. In another place, the new and everlasting covenant of marriage is called the climax of the LDS covenants. When temple marriage is discussed with these glowing descriptions, the biblical explanation is overlooked and the truth of the new covenant is misunderstood. When I was a Latter-day Saint, I understood the new and everlasting covenant to be about temple marriage and the sealing ordinance that would bind families for time and all eternity. This is the common LDS understanding because this is what has been taught by LDS leaders. Consider this message given by the first presidency of the church in 1974. Though relatively few people in this world understand it, the new and everlasting covenant is the marriage ordinance in the holy temple by the properly constituted leaders who hold the genuine authoritative keys. President Spencer W. Kimball defined the New and Everlasting Covenant as the marriage ordinance performed in the LDS Temple. This understanding was confirmed in the February 1995 ensign when Kimball's remarks were again published in the LDS Church's official magazine. Temple marriage is also affirmed in the Doctrine and Covenant student manual published in 2002. It says that the new and everlasting covenant is the covenant of celestial marriage. And then the manual goes on to recite Kimball's definition. So for basically 40 years, Kimball's remarks have been used to teach Latter-day Saints that the new and everlasting covenant is the marriage covenant. But in contrast, when the biblical prophet Jeremiah prophesied about the new covenant, he didn't describe temple marriage. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah prophesied that through this new covenant, God would forgive our sins and remember them no more. The question might be raised, is this prophecy really explaining the new and everlasting covenant, since the Bible uses the phrase new covenant? The answer is yes, because under the topical guides heading for the new and everlasting covenant, we find Jeremiah 31, 31 listed there. So as Jeremiah prophesies about the new and everlasting covenant God was going to make, the key characteristic described is the forgiveness of sins. What is noticeably absent in his prophecy is any mention of celestial marriage or eternal families. For a better understanding of Jeremiah's prophecy, we should look to the New Testament and see how Jesus described the new and everlasting covenant. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, 
For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. At the Last Supper, Jesus mentions the New and Everlasting Covenant by name. This may not be apparent at first, but if you look at the LDS footnote, it clearly shows that the Greek word translated as testament in the King James Version actually means covenant. That being the case, it becomes clear that Jesus is referring to the New and Everlasting Covenant. He tells his disciples that the new covenant is about how his blood will be shed for the forgiveness of sins, which is the same explanation Jeremiah gave more than 600 years earlier. Also in my study, I noticed a rather lengthy section of scripture that compares the law of Moses with the new covenant. It begins in the 8th chapter of Hebrews, where all four verses of Jeremiah's prophecy are recited for context. And then in the 10th chapter, the last two verses of Jeremiah's New Covenant prophecy are quoted again. Between these two prophetic recitations, we find a detailed explanation of the New and Everlasting Covenant. One verse in particular stood out to me, though, because it mentions the New Covenant by name as well. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Again, the fact that this verse mentions the new covenant by name may not be apparent at first, but when you look at the LDS footnote, you can see that the rendering for the word testament should again be covenant. And so while specifically referring to the new covenant, Hebrews 9.15 says that the redemption of transgressions was brought about by the means of Jesus' death. This New Testament epistle explains God's new covenant in the exact same way as both Jeremiah and Jesus. Together, these three biblical passages teach that the new and everlasting covenant is about the forgiveness of sins which is obtained through the shed blood of Jesus. However, when we look at the topical guide's heading for the new and everlasting covenant, none of these New Testament verses are referenced. The book of Hebrews quotes Jeremiah's prophecy about the New Covenant in both the 8th and the 10th chapters, but neither of those two quotations are listed there. Hebrews 9.15 isn't referenced either. And even though four different New Testament writers recorded Jesus' reference to the New Covenant, his description wasn't included in that topic heading. As we look at some of the other LDS scripture study resources, we see that the topical guide isn't the only resource to avoid the biblical explanation of God's new covenant. The LDS resource, the Guide to the Scriptures, doesn't reference any of these biblical verses either. This resource not only omits the verses in the book of Hebrews and Jesus' own description, but it leaves out Jeremiah's prophecy as well. All of these biblical verses refer to the new covenant by name and yet they aren't included in the Guide to the Scriptures. Another omission is found in the LDS Bible Dictionary. At the Last Supper, Jesus said that His blood was the blood of the New Covenant, and then His blood was shed so that the New Covenant would be established. But the LDS Bible Dictionary doesn't have an entry explaining this New Covenant. In spite of all of the biblical verses that refer to the New Covenant by name, the LDS Bible Dictionary doesn't have an entry explaining God's new and everlasting covenant. These omissions were extremely troubling to me, and so I studied further. I've discovered many differences between the Christian and the LDS view of the new covenant. One of the differences is illuminated when LDS resources and doctrines assert that the new and everlasting covenant along with the ordinances performed in the LDS temple, came long before the Law of Moses. The Guide to the Scriptures says that the New and Everlasting Covenant has been enjoyed in every Gospel dispensation where people have been willing to receive it. The LDS Manual, Gospel Principles, expands on that definition and says that the Lord calls it everlasting because it is ordained by an everlasting God and because it will never be changed. 
He gave the same covenant to Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and other prophets. And so we see that LDS doctrine teaches that the new and everlasting covenant has never been changed and that it was available to Adam and Eve. One Ensign article puts it this way. The world does not have in available translations of the Bible a clear record of the covenant that originated with Adam and his people. Thus, the Christian world at large erroneously considers the First Testament, or covenant, to be the Old Testament, or the Law of Moses. This idea that the New Covenant has always been the same, even from the days of Adam, is an essential part of the LDS faith. But let me show you in the New Testament where this LDS teaching is unmistakably refuted. As I mentioned earlier, the book of Hebrews has a three-chapter comparison between the Law of Moses and the New and Everlasting Covenant. And this section of Scripture makes it clear that the first covenant was the Law of Moses. But the LDS Church places so much emphasis on teaching that the New Covenant originated with Adam and proclaiming temple marriage as the legitimate restoration of that ancient covenant, that Latter-day Saints, even those who write articles for the Ensign, are predisposed to either overlook or to reject this biblical truth. This epistle goes on to explain that the New and Everlasting Covenant is the better Second Covenant. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. These verses make it clear that Jesus came to take away the first covenant in order that he could establish the better second covenant. He took away the law of Moses in order to establish the new and everlasting covenant. So why do so many people place their trust in the LDS new and everlasting covenant when it doesn't align with the Bible's consistent explanation? One reason is because the Book of Mormon teaches that many plain and precious parts, even many covenants, have been removed from the Bible. In 1992, the First Presidency of the LDS Church affirmed this Book of Mormon claim by saying that the Bible, as it has been transmitted over the centuries, has suffered the loss of many plain and precious parts. But the Bible hasn't been corrupted over the centuries. In fact, LDS scholar John Welsh, who was the founding director of the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, more commonly known as farms, wrote this about the manuscript evidence for the Bible. In the rush of manuscript discoveries in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many people expected that the earliest texts of the New Testament would prove radically different from the traditional manuscripts handed down through the ages. But the need to revise our texts significantly did not materialize. In spite of the First Presidency's claim that the biblical text has been corrupted over the centuries, John Welsh admits that this isn't the case. The discovery of the earliest New Testament manuscripts actually proved that significant omissions have not taken place. The manuscript evidence for the Bible doesn't show that many covenants were lost. The scribes who copied the biblical text throughout the centuries actually preserve God's word without significant deviations. So when you hear that many plain and precious parts were removed from the Bible, remember that the need to revise the biblical text didn't materialize. This means that God's new and everlasting covenant was never removed from the Bible. The prophetic and apostolic explanations have always been there for us to read, just as Jesus' description at the Last Supper has been as well. While the LDS study helps are described as accurate and trustworthy, even inspired and comprehensive, the explanation of God's new covenant has been withheld from these LDS resources, not from the biblical text. 
This topic of the New and Everlasting Covenant is incredibly important. In 2009, Mormon Apostle D. Todd Christofferson defined God's New Covenant by saying that the New and Everlasting Covenant is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I agree with that statement, and as such, the New Covenant is of great importance to both the Latter-day Saint and the Christian community. In all reality, God's covenant is important to everyone. After all, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Elder Christofferson's remarks continued. The new and everlasting covenant is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, the doctrines and commandments of the gospel constitute the substance of an everlasting covenant between God and man that is newly restored in each dispensation. If we were to state the new and everlasting covenant in one sentence, it would be this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. While Elder Christofferson's remarks seem to align with the biblical explanation of the new covenant, the LDS understanding is still woven into his definition. Elder Christofferson might not have specifically mentioned temple marriage, but temple marriage is one of the necessary doctrines and commandments to which he is referring. And when Elder Christofferson says that the new and everlasting covenant is newly restored in each dispensation, his description is consistent with the LDS belief that the new and everlasting covenant is an ancient covenant that originated with Adam. So even though his description of the new covenant might sound biblical because he suggests that John 3.16 is the best one-sentence explanation. The LDS definition of the New Covenant is about the crowning blessings of temple marriage rather than the forgiveness of sins obtained through the shed blood of Jesus. The LDS view is about the restoration of an ancient New Covenant rather than the establishment of a better Second Covenant. When Elder Christofferson defines the New and Everlasting Covenant as the Gospel of Jesus Christ, this provides some much-needed clarity on one particular issue. Galatians 1, 6-9 is sometimes referenced to express that the LDS Church teaches another Gospel. And while there are many other topics which point out significant differences between the two faiths, no other topic establishes this point as clearly as the New and Everlasting Covenant. When the LDS Church professes a new covenant that doesn't align with the consistent biblical explanation, and their study resources don't reference Jesus' own description, it is clear that they are in fact teaching another gospel, not the true gospel covenant of Christ. The LDS study guides, which were prepared meticulously by church scholars and overseen by respected general authorities, distract you from seeing the crowning event of God's work on earth. They highlight a different message in place of the consistent biblical explanation. The new covenant taught by the LDS Church is a different gospel, and the LDS Scripture study resources are distracting Latter-day Saints from understanding the saving covenant of Jesus Christ. Please, take the time to study this important topic. It is the crowning work of Jesus Christ and the core message of the Bible. Do not put your faith in my words. Explore the truth for yourself. Open the Bible to the book of Hebrews, and as you study that lengthy description, ask God to make His true, new, and everlasting covenant known to you.